the leaders of Japan, the Philippines and the United States have voiced serious concern over China's actions in the disputed South China Sea. The three countries made this known in a joint statement at the end of a critical summit, the first of its kind in Washington, D.C. U.S. President Joe Biden vowed to defend the Philippines from any attack in the South China Sea, calling its support for Manila ironclad. Beijing has stepped up its activities in the strategic waterway in recent years and tensions have risen, particularly with the Philippines, one of several Southeast Asian countries that claim the parts of the sea around their coasts. Last month, Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos said Manila would take countermeasures against China after a confrontation injured its soldiers and damaged vessels. Beijing claims almost the entire South China Sea under its so-called Nine Dash Line, which was rejected by an international court in 2016. The German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is headed to China this weekend, making it his second visit to the country. China is Germany's largest trading partner, and the meeting comes as both economic giants are struggling for more return to DW's Cassandra Sund in Berlin. Uh, great to see you. Uh, Chancellor Scholz uh, last visited China in late 2022, but since then, there's been a change to the German strategy when it comes to China. What has happened? That's right. Since that last visit, Germany has declared that, quote, de-risking is the cornerstone of its new China strategy. That does mirror the mantra of the European Union, which is also talking tough on trade with China. But there does seem to be of a bit of a good cop, bad cop situation when it comes to the EU and Germany's relations with China. While the EU is investigating Chinese-made EVs, for example, Germany is seen as presenting a friendlier face to China than the EU. So this new China strategy was unveiled by the German government last Last summer, and it does suggest that Germany firmly views China as capable of impinging on German economic interests as well as its security. So, even while Schultz is bringing leaders along from several large German businesses like Volkswagen, Siemens, and Bayer, he's urging companies not to put, quote, all your eggs in one basket when it comes to trade. And he's also encouraging them to nurture ties with other trading partners. The risking, like you mentioned, now seems to be the buzzword when it comes to German business relations with China. But how has that been going? Uh, well, it really hasn't. A recent look at whether German businesses are de-risking found no noticeable change. There was a survey by the IW Economic Institute in Cologne, Germany, and it found that, especially in areas such as chemicals or electronics, that there's been, quote, no notable structural de-risking. Now, this was a look at 85 product groups that were looked at, and it, nearly five dozen of the product groups, so well over half, showed high import dependency. The institute did suggest a further study to identify which groups are critically dependent on China, meaning that if China cut off Germany from these products, that it would be hard to quickly replace them. Uh, but it's likely that if that survey was uh, done, that the information would be made available in confidence to those companies. And more than just businesses on the agenda, Chancellor Schultz's visit comes days after the Russian Foreign Affairs Minister was also in China. What happened then? What does Mr. Schultz's visit That's right. signify? The top Russian diplomat was just in Beijing earlier this week, a sign of robust ties between China and Russia. And during a meeting with Minister Sergei Lavrov on Tuesday, President Xi pledged stronger communication with Moscow, adding that the two countries share a drive to reform, quote, global governance. Now, that's a very strong allusion to both China and Russia's view that Western countries have been punching above their weight for far too long. This visit comes as China and Russia have ramped up their economic and diplomatic relations, even in the wake of President Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Now, China has claimed neutrality in the conflict, but has emerged as a key economic lifeline for Russia, which has been isolated by Western sanctions. So that's the backdrop to the German visit to China. The German chancellor spokesman said at a recent press conference that China has influence on Russia, and our wish would be for China to exercise that influence. That's, of course, a direct nod to the Ukraine war, which has stretched 
on for over two years. Kyiv has long hoped that China would step in and play middleman for a peace deal, but so far that's not happened. And this morning, German officials confirmed that they will raise China's support of Russia as a concern on this visit. Cassandra, thanks again. Well, violence in America has become a sad reality as mass shootings occur far too frequently. Our Washington correspondent Maria Verd spoke with the White House official Greg Jackson regarding the Biden-Harris administration's new action to implement Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, expanding firearm background checks to fight gun crime. Mr. Jackson, we thank you so much for joining us as we know you're the Deputy Director for the White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. So we know this has been an area of concern and focus for the administration um, since the inception. Tell us a little bit about why this is so important now, what the president has recently released as far as initiatives around gun violence prevention in America. Yes, uh, well, thank you for having me again. and. Um, you know, gun violence is now the number one cause of premature death for all youth in America. Uh, and as sad as that statistic is, it's something that we can change and that we can prevent. Uh, and this president sees it for what it is. Uh, he's one of the leaders that helped us move forward the first assault weapons ban and some of the key policy changes decades ago uh, that we know can save lives uh, and has been committed since day one to address this crisis of gun violence head on. Uh, this is an administration that has passed more executive actions than any president in history. Uh, and then in summer of 2022, we actually signed into law the first bill to address gun violence in 29 years, the Safer Communities Act. Uh, and this bill had multiple policy measures involved in it that shifted our law, but also included $15 billion to invest in life-saving strategies. It created the 988 um, suicide Lifeline that has had over 8.6 8 million calls since created. It funded the Stronger Connections Program to resource more after-school programs and resources for youth um, who are in at-risk communities or high-need areas. It also made the largest investment in youth mental health in history, adding 14,000 school-based mental health professionals into our public school system. Uh, but a big part of this was also how do we keep guns um, out of the hands of those who are most vulnerable um, or those who are most at risk or most dangerous. Uh, and so we've been looking at how do we get upstream and identify where the guns are coming from uh, and start to crack down on those dangerous sources. Last week, we rolled out the first uh, gun trafficking report in 20 years, and we found that 47.5% of the guns that are being trafficked illegally into communities, illegally into the hands of youth, illegally into the hands of felons or domestic abusers, we found that 47.5% of those we're coming from unlicensed private sellers. Um, and so we know where the source is, but how do we get to those unlicensed private sellers? And so today is big because today we announced the largest expansion of licensing and background check measures for these unlicensed private sellers. So now an additional 20,000 of these individuals are required to be licensed, are required to do background checks before sales, or they will be liable. And this is huge because um, it'll impact the source of guns that we know are going to domestic abusers that are falling into the hands of our youth, that are falling into the hands of felons, and we can go straight to the source to hold those individuals accountable, especially those who are selling online, selling at gun shows, and for too long have been manipulating around the traditional measures that gun stores that are licensed have to go through. Um, and so we're really, really excited about this step. This is the first major expansion of background checks since 1993. Uh, and we know it will have a huge impact on reducing violence in our country. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. We know that um, these requirements and measures around background checks has been a call to action by many Americans. But we also know that there has been a call to um, somewhat ban many types of weaponry um, in the U.S. Where does the administration stand on some of these uh, weapons that have created mass shootings and mass killings across America that we've seen over the last year and even as recent as a few months ago? Well, you know, the president was a part of the last assault weapons ban, but we saw a huge dip in the carnage of these mass shootings and mass tragedies. Uh, and since that ban timed out, he has been fighting relentlessly um, and asking Congress relentlessly to ban assault weapons and to ban high capacity magazines. Uh, and just two weeks ago, the vice president herself, and I was able to join her, 
we walked through the building of the school in Parkland, Florida, uh, where 17 youth were shot and killed. And the carnage of an assault weapon is something you can't imagine. I mean, we saw youth that were, that were shot or injured, and the bullet went through two or three doors or walls. Um, we saw the type of carnage that doesn't just injure someone, it could amputate someone. And that is the, that is the real danger of these high capacity magazines and assault weapons that were designed for war, that were designed for battlefield, uh, but now are in our backyard. Deputy Director Jackson, you know the world is watching um, how the U.S. is responding to the issues around gun violence. What do you say to the rest of the world who's wondering how safe America is today? Um, what are you saying to them around how safe it is for those who are looking to come and move here, who are living here, those who are in colleges that are international students, um, and those who have relocated to the U.S.? How safe is the U.S. if you look at it from a year-to-year -year comparison um, and as it relates to the rest of the world, where oftentimes some places guns are banned, um, guns are not allowed to be carried uh, by civilians? You know, there's no doubt about it that gun violence is a real crisis here. Um, it's, it's frankly the largest public health crisis of our time. And when you look at the numbers where 140,000 people are shot or killed um, by firearms in this country, uh, we know how urgent it is. Uh, but the president believes, and I believe, and I think so many Americans believe that this is a country that can bounce back from tragedy, that can overcome crisis, uh, that can stand up uh, in its darkest moment and see the light and fight to get there. This is the president who's moved forward more executive actions than any president in history that has moved forward and created the first ever National Red Flag Resource Center. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on of what steps we're taking. And what I will say to people who aren't in this country, um, who are, or maybe who are from this country and left due to the violence, uh, you know, things are getting better. Um, we saw a 13.2% reduction in homicides last year, the sharpest decrease in homicides and gun-related deaths in American history. Well, Deputy Director Jackson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time. We appreciate um, you taking the time to share with us about this next step in the fight against gun violence in the U.S. All right, thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. Our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird, in a chat with the White House of spokes official, Greg Jackson, regarding gun violence in the United States. Let's move on. Kenyan doctors have been staging protests in their push for better pay and working conditions. The doctors are demanding a commitment from the government to fulfill collective bargaining agreements signed in 2017. But President William Ruto says the country has no money to pay the doctors and asks them to return to work. A public hospital in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, laid off 100 doctors who are taking part in a nationwide strike that has been ongoing for almost a month. Kenyan journalist Cyrus Mbati, who has been following developments on the story, brings us up to speed from Nairobi. It's now a month since the doctors started their strike in Kenya, and uh, they are paralyzed services in most hospitals, actually in all 57 public hospitals in the country. Those are the main ones. And since the doctor started uh, in last month, in, on, on 13th, the clinicians have joined them in the same strike. And uh, the, the, the other the support workers who are supposed to be kind of like cleaners, they have also threatened to join from tomorrow. And uh, since then, it has been a ping pong game between <laughs> the government and uh, the doctors, the union, which is presenting the, the issues. And the problem is that uh, no one wants to sit down because the government is claiming that uh, there's a court order which stopped the, 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 the strike itself, so they can't negotiate with the uh, doctors who are on strike against the court order which is in place. But the doctors are saying the courts should not be used to kind of stop their, their move or that they are called for, for their justice. The whole thing started in, in 2017 when the government and the then uh, uh, union officials signed a collective bargaining agreement to ensure that uh, the doctor interns uh, are paid well, around 200,000 Kenyan shillings, and the doctors are, who have finished their internship are employed immediately, they finished their internship. But then uh, when the new government came in place, they kind of, um, they're trying to renege on their whole agreement saying that 
uh, it's too expensive, they can't afford to, to pay the doctors. So there's a standoff between the, the government officials and the uh, doctors' union, which, which has actually escalated to this level that uh, now we are seeing the operations are being paralyzed uh, all over. The opposition have uh, said they may join the doctors' protests uh, in one way or the other to push for the government to agree. The, the church has also joined the whole foray. They are saying the government and the doctors' union must sit down and agree on the way forward. Uh, I mean, today we saw there's a court order which has been issued again to stop the, the other workers who are threatened to start the strike tomorrow from joining the strike. But uh, we don't know whether they also agree with the court order because they are also saying the government is using the courts to kind of try to muzzle their operations. Now, we don't know what will happen next because uh, last night the head of public service here in Kenya issued a statement that saying that he can't they can't go into the negotiating table until and after the doctors kind of denounce the, the, the strike and go back to work so that they can continue to stay to, to for the talks. But the doctors today also had a press conference saying they can't, there's nothing of the sort, they have to talk now as they are on strike. So it's a standoff which is ongoing. Some uh, regional governments have announced that they are going to sack the doctors uh, who are on strike for them to kind of employ others on temporary measures. We don't know how that's going to play out because uh, we see it as some part of the, the schemes they are using to intimidate and force the doctors to join uh, Okada to go, to go back to work. But the doctors also have issued a statement saying they, they don't care, they don't, they can't be intimidated, let them be sacked, and they are ready for, for any kind of uh, any remedy that may come out of that. Because uh, the, the, this, uh, the county government are saying that uh, whatever is going on rather between the, the doctors and the national government it should be solved immediately and those who are on strike they are there illegally and they stand sacked. We understand some counties have sacked almost 100 uh, doctors but uh, that may be solved once there is an agreement between the doctors and uh, the, the, the government or the, those are negotiating parties because they will have a, what we call a return to work formula which will now include that all those who have been taken, uh, whose action have been taken against allowed to come back to work. The United Nations has asked Mali's military junta to lift its recent ban on political activity in the West African country. Opposition groups have also been critical of the move by the military authorities which have been in power since a 2020 coup. This has increased tensions that have been building up since the junta broke its promise to hold presidential elections in February. Several political parties and civil society groups in Mali have rejected the ruling junta's order to suspend political activities, vowing to stage demonstrations over the move. South Africa's Electoral Commission is appealing to the Constitutional Court's decision to overturn a ban on former President Jacob Zuma standing in the forthcoming election. The commission had barred his candidacy, arguing that the constitution bars people who have been sentenced to more than 12 months in prison from public office. Mr. Zuma was given a 15 months for contempt of court in 2021, though he only served three months in jail. Earlier this week, South Africa's electoral court overturned that ruling, but did not publish its reasoning. The Electoral Commission has now asked the country's highest court to provide legal clarification on the issue. Meanwhile, Mr. Zuma's opposition party uh, has called for the immediate resignation of Janet Love, a top official at uh, South Africa's Electoral Commission. The MK party says Ms. Love should not be involved in the elections due to her previous ties to the ruling ANC. Elsewhere now, a Tunisian woman is providing love and care to hundreds of animals that are sick. The pet lover has turned her house to some sort of hospital for the ailing creatures in Sidi Hussein in, the Tunis, in Tunis, the Tunisian capital. Tunisian woman Huda Bouchada has turned her home into an animal sanctuary for over 400 cats and 20 dogs. Her haven for the creatures is in Sidi Hussein, in the southwest of the capital, Tunis. I'm Huda Bouchada. 
a 43-year-old woman and a pet lover, especially cats and dogs. Huda cares for the animals every day. The furry friends receive daily attention for a range of conditions. She is preparing food and medications while explaining that she had had to move several times due to landlords having issues with the number of cats and dogs. I live in the city of Sidi Hussein, and before that, I had relocated among several areas. I had relocated to several areas, including Sidi Tabet, Ariana, Dar al Hush, and Na Asan. The owners of all the houses I rented expelled me because they did not like cats. Her dedication has taken its toll on her own health, although she says. She has become used to feeling tired and would only worry if she took a day off, even though a month-long break would be very welcome if she knew her pets were getting the best care. I have no job. I spend all my time with the animals. I long for one month break so I can sleep free of any thoughts as my body is extremely exhausted right now. But I've really gotten used to it. When a day passes without having something to do or exert efforts, I feel sick. Huda offers some very complex care for her animals indeed, with some cats needing treatment for cancer, feline AIDS, kidney and urology issues, as well as diabetes. Furry friends indeed. Let's move on. Chinese classical pianist Lang Lang has been honored with the star on the Hollywood iconic Walk of Fame, becoming the first Asian to receive the award. He received the award along his wife, alongside his wife and Universal Music Group executive president Michelle Anthony. The pianist has achieved simultaneous mainstream success as his albums were sold millions worldwide topping classical charts while in 2009 time magazine recognized him as one of the hundred most influential people in the world I really hope to teach and inspire as many people as possible to learn an instrument, whether it's piano or anything else. But of course, in my mind, piano, first choice, okay? Always. And I know that there are few greatest pianists uh, who having a star like Horowitz, Rubinstein, Rudolf Zerke, and Paderewski, and to be with them, I, I, I could never imagine. I mean, this is like, are you sure this is a reality? I mean, yeah. I, I like to say that uh, um, the common ground uh, is always music, whether you are grew up in Beijing or Boston. Um, it reminds us that we aren't that different at all. Um, the world communicates through music. Lang Lang's Young Scholars Program then mentors selected young pianists from the program, providing them with unique performance opportunities on some of the world's most prestigious stages. I came today because I've been a fan of Lang Lang's music for a long, long time. Um, he played today and was beautiful. I've tried to get tickets to his concerts, but they've been sold out, so <laughs> this was amazing to actually see him get his star. Congratulations to him and his entire family. That's our show today. Thank you for watching. I'm Jocker Rogers.